Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining uh, on this Louisiana Biomedical Research Network uh, seminar. Uh, my name is Gus uh, Kusulas, for those that uh, may not know me. I'm the uh, principal investigator of the Louisiana Biomedical Research Network. I'm also a professor of virology and biotechnology at the LSU School of Veterinary Medicine and head of the Department of Pathobiological Sciences. Uh, just to give you a brief introduction of LBRN, LBRN is funded by the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences through the uh, IDEA Network, Network for Biomedical Research Excellence Program, um, acronym INBRI. Uh, it's now on, uh, on the 20th year. The uh, purpose of this program is to um, provide support, training, and funding throughout the state of Louisiana. We have uh, eight uh, principal, primarily undergraduate institutions, uh, including three HBCUs, but uh, we're also serving a lot of community colleges uh, and other institutions. Overall, I believe 26, 27 institutions throughout the state of Louisiana. The um, LBRN, which is the acronym of our program, is um, fostering biomedical research and training and we have a particular emphasis on bioinformatics uh, and data science. One of the uh, major components of what we do is providing mentoring uh, with senior investigators, helping junior investigators uh, throughout the uh, network. And in that, um, uh, for that purpose, it's quite important uh, to hear from senior faculty members um, especially members of HBCUs, uh, leading universities like Howard University, of their experience over the years uh, in medical education and training um, undergrad students, medical students, and graduate students. So uh, today I have the uh, distinct uh, pleasure and honor to uh, introduce to you our today's seminar speaker, Dr. Uh, Philip Ruan, who is a professor at Howard University uh, College of Medicine. Uh, it's particularly um, important to me because, uh, as you'll see, Dr. Ron and me uh, were both linked to um, Professor Bernard Reutzman, uh, who recently uh, retired from the University of Chicago, member of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, really the father, grandfather uh, of herpes uh, molecular biology and virology and immunopathogenesis over the years. And Dr. Wan was one of the first graduate students and person that was intimately linked um, in the first years of Dr. Bernard Roisman's uh, career. So uh, Dr. Wan um, had, has had a Bachelor of Science degree from Morgan State University, a Master of Science from the Department of Microbiology, School of Hygiene and Public Health from Johns Hopkins University, and a doctor of philosophy from the Department of Microbiology, University of Maryland, College Park, uh, Maryland. He um, worked for a while, including in industry. He assumed the position as assistant professor at the Harvard University, ultimately rising to his current position. He has uh, authored a number of very important papers, but even more importantly, has received a number of awards uh, uh, outstanding among them is his uh, not a number of awards on as an outstanding teacher and instructor, uh, not only for the medical students, but also the, uh, the, you know, the graduate students themselves, including uh, historically from the very beginning in the 70s, but also even more importantly, receiving the uh, uh, Howard University College of Medicine Outstanding Teaching Award in uh, 2022. Uh, Dr. Wan has published a number of very important papers. He has contributed to a number of different uh, committees. And uh, Howard University recently, uh, in February of 2022, marked the 50th anniversary of Dr. Philip Rowan's uh, appointment to the Faculty of College of Medicine. And uh, in that sense, really recognizing his huge uh, contribution to the Howard University medical and other uh, programs. So uh, I'm delighted to have um, Dr. Wan share his journey with us here, uh, hoping to also 
uh, encourage everybody, including uh, any of our minority uh, and other students to, to, to see how a career uh, like Dr. Wan's has evolved and uh, hoping that would encourage everybody to pursue um, similar careers in biomedical research, teaching, and training. Uh, Philip, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Gus. Thank you for such a warm and wonderful introduction. Uh, I'd like to say uh, that I'm very grateful for the invitation to uh, present uh, some aspects of my journey uh, to, to, to you uh, through the LBRN. Um, I um, am sort of, in a way, I'm overwhelmed by this opportunity, and in a way I'm not, because I think about what I've done and I'm doing uh, all the time. But it's a question of organizing it and presenting it in a way that is maybe of some interest and maybe more importantly, maybe of some help to other students in the form of inspiration or and, and uh, will help them to continue and be successful in their own on their own paths. Um, uh, I think that uh, <clears throat> I'll go to the first uh, slide and this will sort of prompt me to now this is a uh, this is a beginning of a uh, summary of the some of the major academic institutions that I've been affiliated with, starting with uh, Morgan State University, which was called Morgan State College when I attended in 1958. Uh, and uh, you see on the top left, the, the building, one of the buildings, I think it was Holmes Hall, that was uh, has become an iconic building on that campus. And you can see uh, adjacent to it is a picture of a more recent uh, edifice that has uh, sprung up on the campus. And I put that picture in the second picture in to let everyone know that Morgan hasn't been standing still, just as LSU and Howard and other universities haven't been standing still. Morgan, Morgan has not been standing still from, uh, from many points of view, including uh, modern architecture. This was followed, my days at Morgan were followed uh, by, in four, four years later uh, by my entry um, uh, affiliation with uh, the Johns Hopkins School of Hygiene and Public Health, as it was called at that time. And you can see that I was spent eight years there. And these were among the most fruitful years, that, eight years that I ever spent anywhere. And this was followed by uh, my PhD uh, uh, efforts at uh, the University of Maryland at College Park, and this is one of the buildings that was uh, in use at that time. As you all know, Maryland is a, uh, a fairly large school. That's you know, I'm not sure is as large as LSU, but it's it's large, and it goes into that category. And uh, and then um, and I like to start with my. Uh, uh, and then I'll end up at Howard University. I'd like to start with uh, Morgan State University. I think that's logical because it, to be honest, uh, one doesn't spring into virology uh, out of uh, the clear blue sky. And so uh, I did receive some wonderful education at Morgan State uh, College as it was known. And one, one of the interesting things I'd like to point out is that just, I graduated from Douglas High School in February of 1946. And within, in, in April of 1946, I was drafted into the US Army, uh, US Army and I was given an opportunity to uh, receive the uh, GI Bill of Right, the GI Bill, support for education. And that was of critical importance to me because I, came, I come from a very poor family I always wanted to go to college, but, but to be honest, I had no idea how I was gonna pay for it. And then this opportunity presented itself. And of course I took advantage of it. While I was in the army, I, one of the things that I did, which turned out to be very helpful to me was I enrolled in a uh, educational program for at the undergraduate level that the, uh, that the, the US Army and US Army Air Force is sponsored. And I enrolled in the course in literature. And, and this required that I read plays by Shakespeare and read other works by 
English and American uh, uh, writers. And this was a very you know, wise decision in retrospect because when I went to Morgan, that meant I didn't have to register for some of the English classes or literature classes. And this allowed me to take uh, courses in economics in my uh, first year, second year at Morgan. And uh, economics is, you know, not on, on the surface, it's not too closely related to science, but I had a sense that, you know, one of the, uh, one of the uh, mistakes that some people make is that they don't avail themselves of information in other fields that are important uh, in, in terms of everyday life. And so when I got, as I said, when I got to Morgan, they said, oh man, that's nice, you know, so you know, you, you won't have to take literature uh, the courses in year in, in the second semester or third semester. And as I said, I, uh, I, I enrolled in economics class and one of the, my, the instructor that I had was a man by the name of Fre Frederick Jackson. He was a truly outstanding uh, uh, instructor. And I had several other very important instructors. Uh, the man who taught me physics, uh, college physics 101 and 102 was a man named Luna Michoud, who later, who later became the president of Delaware State University in, in uh, Dover, Delaware, which is uh, historically uh, HBCU. And I had some uh, a lecturer in, bio, in chemistry, organic chemistry. His name was Harold Delaney, and he was a product of Howard University. He was, I think, he was the very first PhD graduate of the Department of Chemistry here at Howard University, and he turned out to be a very, very wonderful lecturer and and a good friend. And of course, I had several other very important instructors. Uh, in uh, in various courses and when i first went to morgan my first two years i must say i was i was interested enough and i was lucky enough to enroll in courses that really excited me and i was on the dean's list for for the first two years but after that i started running into courses that weren't so you know very interesting and whatever and my grades sort of lagged and uh I, I fell off the dean's list, but I never forgot the information I learned. And during this time, the latter two years, I did enroll in courses in, for example, biochemistry, uh, which was taught by a man who was a graduate of the School of Hygiene at Johns Hopkins. His name was Al, uh, uh, Al Alonzo Johnson. He was a very, very uh, brilliant uh, black man. And I, I always remember him very fondly. Now, the, so Morgan provided me with uh, exposure to scientific courses, philosophy courses, uh, literature. I learned how to write fairly well uh, at Morgan because we had an, uh, had an excellent teacher by the name of Dr. Jean Turpin, who was a black woman who was very, very, very talented at uh, in teaching uh, English uh, to people who were not necessarily desiring to become English teachers or whatever. But she was extremely, uh, very, very, very powerful and effective. So Morgan was extremely useful to me. And uh, I, I did make a mark, uh, as I said, for the first couple of years. And after that, I sort of dropped off a little, but I did learn. So those, those were my days at Morgan. After I left Morgan, I went to, uh, I worked at the post, US post office for a little while because jobs were very difficult to find in Baltimore at the time. This was in 1952, I graduated and uh, Baltimore was a far cry from what it is uh, today in terms of employment opportunities for black people. And one of the uh, incidents that I'd like to uh, describe for you just to set the tone for uh, some aspects of Baltimore is this. After my first year at Morgan, I, I tried to work during the summer to earn money, of course. And I was applying to the Bethlehem Steel Company, a shipbuilding company rather, for a job. 
Well, you can imagine there were hundreds of uh, people, mostly men who were, or males who were signing up for and uh, eager to get those jobs because they paid well and they were, you know, they, they were available during the summer. And so I, uh, when uh, the procedure was you, you, you met at a site and you, you formed a line and they, you would be interviewed. Well, one of the interesting things that, that occurred to me, and I've never forgotten because it was extremely instructive in terms of, of what was going on. Now, the, 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 the people, the two fellows who, in, who in interviewed us were stu white students who lived in an affluent uh, section of Baltimore known as Roland Park. And I think they were Johns Hopkins University students. And they, while I was in line, I got close enough to the desk, the interview desk, to overhear them talking about some other white students, people who were in line, who were from a different part of Baltimore known as Highland Town. Now, Highland Town is a, is a low income, was a low income section of Baltimore where a lot of uh, white folks lived. And they, you, it was, I was uh, somewhat amazed, I'm not totally surprised, but somewhat amazed at the, the tone and the tenor of their remarks about those, those young guys. And they, they, in effect, put them down. And the reason that was so instructive to, was so uh, instructive to me, or has stood out to me, is because I realized that if these guys were, uh, felt that way about their own folks, I knew it became, you know, crystal clear uh, the what the road I had to navigate, and it's not like I didn't know this before I got there to, to this particular situation because I grew up in Baltimore, I was born in Baltimore, and I knew about it. But, but uh, it was it just struck me as very uh, it, uh, it it provided a lesson that I never forgot. And so, you know, instead of being discouraged by that, I said, well, you know, this, what this means is you have to learn how to navigate. You must be, you must understand your, who you're dealing with and you must learn how to navigate. And so that, you know, that was my approach. Now, after, uh, after as I said, after I finished Morgan, I worked at the post office for a little while, then I got a job uh, working for uh, a, a paint laboratory uh, manufacturer that didn't work out very well. And then I uh, got a job as a technician as, in a biochemistry lab at Hopkins, working for a guy who was an outstanding biochemist, but I was not, it turned out I wasn't trained to work in a biochemistry lab. I had not received any training along those lines at Morgan. The training I had was really basic science, but basic uh, chemistry. They taught you how to titrate uh, bases, acids and bases, and how to weigh, uh, how to determine some aspects of quantitative analysis. But I, was, uh, I wasn't prepared to, to be a biochemistry technician, laboratory technician. So that didn't work too well. But then fortunately for me, I went to Morgan State the employment office at Morgan State University College. And the guy, his name was Baker. And he, uh, he uh, arranged for me to be interviewed by a uh, Dr. Manfred Mayer. And Dr. Mayer was, had just hired Bernard Roisman, who you see, whose picture you see here. And uh, Dr. Roisman, uh, Dr. Bernard Roisman is, uh, remains one of my lifelong friends. And he uh, was a uh, very uh, instrumental in me being where I am today. Now, the, the, my days at Hopkins were, it, were it spanned about eight years. I was hired as a technician. And as you see in this uh, quotation from his, one of his Roisman's articles, you'll see, uh, you see my name there in bold, and you see that he uh, he acquired me as a technician, which is true. I started out as a technician in the lab, and I worked my way up. 
Now, the lab, let me say a few words about the lab because it's very instructive, I think, for students who are coming along in the, in the biological sciences under Dr. Kasulis and others who are associated with him. This laboratory, this was back in 1956 now, is rather primitive by, by today's standards. And the, um, what the setting was this, Dr. Mayer was a, was a world-renowned expert in complement. The comp and he did many of the seminal uh, experiments uh, which illuminated the mechanism of action of many of the proteins that we know um, that make up the, the complement uh, system, the classical complement system. And he had been uh, uh, asked to to take on a project by the National in uh, Institute for Infantile Paralysis, which was a major uh, organization that supported research in infantile paralysis or polio, polio or polio. And the issue that he was asked to trying to resolve was this. It had been observed that uh, when, when study, when scientists uh, trying to monitor the progression from the acute phase of infection with polio virus to the convalescent phase of infection with that virus. The results were very contradictory, uh, they call it very confusing, and, could, and no one could make heads or tails out of what, what they really meant. And so what Dr. May was, he led the effort uh, to purify polio virus, and we found that he made the observation here along with Dr. Roisman, uh, found that uh, there were two, in fact, there were, there were two populations of particles that were produced in cells infected with wild-type polio virus. One class of particle was a particle was, that was RNA-less, and it was called a seed, and it had an antigenicity that was called the C-type antigen. And it was found that particles in this, uh, in this uh, family of, of, of particles reacted more, more uh, reproducibly with acute phase serum. And then the second class of particles that was identified, and this was, uh, these, these two classes of particles were really identified on the basis of uh, um, bullion density ice uh, ultra centrifugation and sucrose density uh, is centrifugation density centrifugation and we had the two bands what you would see I remember the first time they showed me what those two bands uh, looked like in a tube that held about five milliliters or less of, of solution including the sucrose density gradients and the bands uh, and these uh, and these these particles were present at a concentration of uh, 10 to the 13 particles in the so-called d fraction of the of the density gradient now the d fraction uh, particles in the d fraction of the of the fractionation uh, <clears throat> were more reproducibly reactive with so-called convalescent serum. Well, this was a major contribution that was made by the lab, Manfred Mayer's lab, uh, under, the, under the leadership of Dr. Roisman, because doc, what Dr. Mayer wisely did was he hired uh, Bernard shortly after he received, Bernard, that is, received his SCD at Hopkins. And he was uh, an, a virologist. And so he was given the responsibility of I just wanted to say, uh, I was saying that, and it's very important that I repeat this. I, I started out as a technician with Dr. Roisman under his leadership, and he and uh, thought enough of me as, uh, as, as a technician to offer me an opportunity to become a student in the grad school and, and seek a master's degree. Now, this was a very important if you understand anything about the context of race, racial relationships uh, in 1956 in Baltimore, 
I can tell you that there were very, very few people who worked at Johns Hopkins University as black people who worked as technicians and very relatively few who worked in the School of Hygiene as technicians. And certainly there were, I can't remember that there were any American, Afri African American uh, students uh, who attended uh, uh, a school, any classes in, in, that, in that facility. Now, remember I told you that Alonzo Johnson was a product of, uh, of the School of Hygiene, which is the same school that we were in at the time. And so he did, the, he was a product there. But what I'm saying now is that now is that at that time, this was a very rare event for uh, an African American person to be hired as a technician, and even rare for an African American to be accepted into one of the um, uh, degree granting programs at the, at that school, and so I you know I I felt extremely uh, lucky and fortunate to have, uh, uh, first of all, to have gotten the job as a technician, and then to have had the uh, correct approach to, uh, to, to my job and my responsibilities and, and uh, the sensitivity to understand what I needed to do and how I needed to conduct myself. And so it all paid off in the sense that Dr. Roisman offered me a an opportunity to, be, to become a, a graduate student. And uh, another very important event that happened there was that when I took virology under Bernard, uh, my first exam grade was a B. And I was, you know, very happy because, you know, the, the subject matter was kind of challenging. But he called me aside and said, Phil, you know, this is fine. You passed, but you should do better. You should get an A and you should, you should strive to get A's. And so that really, uh, really encouraged me. And it made me feel that, uh, you know, that, you know, that I was, uh, that, I, that I really had his very sincere and wholehearted support. And that has uh, stayed with me over the last uh, 70 years or so or more. So this, uh, I cannot say enough, uh, you know, about my gratitude to Dr. Roisman in terms of uh, him, his having offered me those opportunities because uh, for example, many, 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 many white people would not have even given me, you know, the time of day, let alone a chance to, uh, to, to enroll in a very highly, uh, Credited, credited uh, program. So I'm very grateful. Now, in terms of uh, the work, some of the studies that were done when my work first went there, I, we were working with polio virus. And if you had a chance to look at my CV, you'll see that I did a co-author a paper or so with uh, Drs. Roisman and Mayer. I made a contribution, my name was on there not because they liked me so much, but because I did uh, make uh, some suggestions or proposals that we do certain studies. And it turned out that uh, the studies that in which we use heat and uh, ultraviolet radiation, we, these, uh, with the, the application of those two uh, tools uh, were bore fruit because we, we learned something about the, uh, the plasticity of um, polio virus antigenicity. So that was, that, was, that was a contribution that was made at that time. Then uh, Dr. Roisman switched away from polio virus to, uh, to polyoma virus. And my master's degree was based on studies of uh, polyoma virus, which is one of course, one of the major oncogenic uh, DNA viruses that we know so much about today. And uh, the studies that, uh, that were conducted at, at Hopkins were uh, under Dr. Roisman's uh, guidance uh, were very, very interesting and very, very, very fruitful. And, uh, and, and I received a lot of uh, uh, training in terms of how to handle viruses, how to look at 
uh, to understand the various assays, the underlying factors at play in the various assays. And so uh, this was, uh, and this, in, this, in, this instruction, this opportunity, this exposure has stood with me for many, many, many years. Now, under what after I got my I received my uh, master's degree in 1960, uh, which was four years after I started there, and so for me that wasn't too bad. You know, that was that means that I received my master's degree eight years after I left Morgan. After I finished Morgan, that's a long time. You know, in terms of the way students like to progress today. But, uh, you know, I was pleased because I, at least I wasn't a pauper while I was studying. I was well paid uh, and I, uh, I, I lived fairly well for, for a poor boy, for a poor black boy who had come up, you know, uh, under rather uh, uh, challenging uh, uh, conditions. And so, then at night in between 1960 and 64, when Dr. Roisman switched again from polyoma viruses to herpes simplex virus, primarily type one, uh, you know, we made a, a number of observations, uh, a number of pub publications that uh, Dr. Kasulis has uh, referenced to, uh, or alluded to that I co-authored with Dr. Roisman. And of course, I was very, very happy to be able to uh, participate at that level. Now, one of the interesting things to me, one of the highlights of my stay uh, at Hopkins during that time was the first paper that I was the serious paper that I was a lead author on was published in the journal Virology. And it was the first, it turned out it was the very first publication in, in this particular issue. So I was really, really excited. And the following summer, I went to Cold Spring Harbor up in Oyster uh, Harbor, I guess it is, or Cold Spring Harbor, New York. And one of the editors of, uh, of Virology uh, greeted me and said that, uh, you know, I hope you come back again soon. So that was his way of saying, you know, you know well done. And uh, I was very, very pleased. Now, Having mentioned Cold Spring Harbor, I can't help but re, re, uh, relate the following facts. Number one, I met some some of the leading lights of virology uh, at Cold Spring Harbor. I met Ren Renato Del Becco, who received the Nobel Prize, as you all know, who, who are virologists would know that. He was the person who developed the plaque assay and his uh, approach to the plaque assay is what I still teach today. And I have a reputation around how it is, as the guy who always teaches uh, the plaque assay. They say it rather, you know, fondly, I hope. Uh, the, uh, another person that I met there was Dr. Uh, David Baltimore. I met Dr. Baltimore uh, at, uh, at Cold Spring Harbor. I'd also met him at one of the ASM meetings, and there is this classification scheme. That, well, David Baltimore is, is he received the Nobel Prize for his his uh, co-discovery of reverse transcriptase and uh, or reverse transcription, I should say. And so, and uh, it turns out that I introduced David to his wife, his who was a person named Alice Wong, who was also at Hopkins doing the years I was there. And so I, I guess I had a multiple, a multi, multi-talented, I guess you'd say. Uh, <clears throat> and I also met uh, Dr. Uh, Jen Watson uh, at Cold Spring Harbor. And I must say the encounter was not pleasant, but because uh, as many of you know, Dr. Watson has a sort of a, a racist ten tendency and he expressed this, uh, uh, that uh, attitude uh, to me directly, but I, I held my cool and I, I uh, decided that I didn't want to uh, be floating down the Long Island Sound because, under mysterious circumstances. So I said, well, I'll, you know, I'll just, I'll have, this is one 
one uh, barb that I'll have to take and and deal with it and and prove him wrong and you know in that uh, in the sense that I can make a contribution to virology and that's the way I looked at it now I think for the audience at large there's one thing I must say that if you understand anything about racial relations in this country starting around 19 in the, in the mid early 50s and, and, and up to today, you will immediately understand that I, a person like me could not have made it without the support of, uh, of white, some white people who were, who were very friendly to me and very supportive. And I think that is worth citing because the, the, we know that the, the, the atmosphere, the environment here at, uh, in our country at the moment is very, uh, very tense with respect to racial relationships. And so uh, it turns out that certain uh, people have, uh, have, white people have been very, very supportive to me over time. Uh, Dr. Kasulis is, is a person who has been very nice to me. And, and, and of course, I've, I've indicated my, my great gratitude to Dr. Roisman. I'm very grateful to Dr. Mayer for having hired me in the first place and Roisman for taking over being my boss and being willing to, to help guide me. So I, I have to say that. Now, there are, of course, there were incidents there were events that happened where the uh, interaction with white folks wasn't a white person, rather not folks, but a person were not so fruitful or friendly or whatever. But uh, you know that wasn't the that, that wasn't the end all or the be all, and I wasn't going to let that be. And I think we all have to deal with that in our own way. I think that that. Uh, my, my uh, years at, at, uh, at, at uh, Hopkins were very, very fruitful. And I really learned virology uh, early on. And as Dr. Kosula said, I, I did make some contributions through, with Dr., through Dr. Roisman or with Dr. Roisman as you may desire. And uh, I'm very grateful for that. But the thing, one of the major benefits of having been a, a student of Roisman's is that he really taught me how to write and how to think about viruses because his approach was, uh, was his own. And he had a very deep insight into uh, 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 the branch of biology that we call virology. And so, uh, it has stead, stood me in good stead all through the, through the years. Now, the, my next major academic institution that I was uh, involved with was at Maryland, uh, University of Maryland at College Park. This is where I received my PhD. And um, the, my mentor was a man named Frank Hetrick. Now, Frank Hetrick was a very, he was a white guy. And he was a very, very nice guy and very supportive of me in many ways. And I can tell you that the, uh, the atmosphere in Maryland, uh, in, uh, in that department and uh, other departments on the campus was not very friendly toward black, black folks. And some of, the, some of the people that I graduated with Oh, you know, very, were very dismissive of me in the sense that because I was black, I, I didn't really belong, uh, you know, with them. And I received this cold shoulder, so to speak, at a post-graduation picnic that departments um, held. And one of the guys, he made it very clear that he did not like the fact that I was uh, also a PhD who I had graduated from College Park. But while I was at College Park, I did meet some very good uh, people and made some very good friends. 
And I remained a very good friend of uh, Frank Hedricks until he passed several years ago. And so I'm very, very grateful. So I think you understand uh, for young students, you have to understand that you will meet different people who have different attitudes toward you for various different for various reasons. And some will be favorable and some will not. But you cannot be cannot allow yourself to be deterred because not every white person wants to be your buddy. They really don't, many of them do not want to be your buddy. But that's okay. Because you know, you can flip the uh, flip the slip and say, well, you don't necessarily want to be their buddy. You know, it, it doesn't follow that, you know, you have to be anybody's buddy, you know, for as far as that goes. And so, but on the other hand, you'd make a mistake if you think that all white people are against you. That's not true. And, the, and uh, we see that the leader at LSU, Dr. Kasulis, is, is certainly has, has done a tremendous job in extending his, his, his uh, philosophy and his support and interest in, in HBCUs uh, throughout the state of Louisiana. And I think for that, he is to be commended. And I, so when he asked me to present the seminar, I couldn't, I, there was no way in the world that I would, could, could refuse to want to uh, participate in or present a, a seminar. Well, it was agreed that I would not talk so much about science because face it, the, the most of the contributions, the publications that I have are somewhat dated. And I know that enough from, from what's going on currently in research, that if people are if a person attends, attends a research seminar, they expect to hear the, the latest work you've done. Not they're not there for a review of what you did some number of years ago. But the main reason that I think that Dr. Kasulis invited me to give this seminar is because I've spent the last 50 years at Howard University College of Medicine. And this is where a lot of the experiences, the education, the information that I had collected over the preceding 20 or 30 years came to fruition because I have been very successful here at the College of Med at Howard University's College of Medicine. I was hired in 1972, February the 2nd official was my official date. Uh, and the guy who hired me was, uh, what, who, who, who uh, initiated this was, a, was the chair of the department. His name was Willie Turner. He, has long, he passed some years ago, but he was the guy, person who hired me. And uh, he was a young guy, he was younger than I am. And, uh, and and we knew each other pretty well. Having he was a virologist who spent a lot of his professional time at NIH, and I worked uh, between my time at uh, Hopkins and the time I the point in time that I joined the faculty at, at Howard. I worked for a company called Microbiological Associates, which was located in Bethesda at the time. And this company had a lot of contracts with the NIH. And therefore there was a lot of interaction between personnel at the professional and technical levels between microbiological associates and uh, the, in the various laboratories uh, at the NIH, especially the Institute for, for Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is now headed by, as we all know, doc, by Dr. Fauci. Anthony Fauci, who we met, uh, who I met, by the way, at uh, Howard, he gave, he came and gave a seminar some years ago at, uh, at, the, at, the, at the invitation of Dr. Of Dr. Turner. Now, when I first got to Howard, uh, the, the, uh, the buildings were rather old. Uh, this is, this building that you see now is the ceiling mud building. That is the most that is the most. Uh, that's the newest building that has, that is a part. That is a part of the basic science uh, uh, complex. 
And then, of course, we have the hospital, which is a freestanding uh, inst uh, building, which is behind, is south of the College of Medicine, about a block, the equivalent of a block or so south of the College of, uh, of Medicine. When I, as I started to say, when I got to, Mer uh, to, Hop to um, Howard, I was um, asked to give lectures in the virology course the very first semester I was there. And not bragging, but uh, I turned out I was voted the, uh, the, the best lecturer or the out most outstanding lecturer for, by the freshman of that, of that year. And this was uh, this was uh, this the only reason I mentioned this is because uh, this I was competing with a lot of several people at least who were really outstanding, and you know I, I just figured I didn't have a chance. But as fate would have it, I was well prepared with my material. Uh, as a result of having been at, at Hopkins and at Maryland and at Microbiological Associates. And so I could, I stood my ground and I had, uh, through Dr. Turner, I learned how to organize um, virology in a way that would be useful to medical and dental students. And this is a type of education and instruction and effort that I have continuously made since I've been here, since I uh, started in 1972. Because as it turns out, uh, many medical, most medical students are, will, will, will tell you that they really don't need to know all of the details of the regulation of the expression of the HSV-1 genome. What they really need to know includes some of the major diseases that the virus causes, therapy that is available for some of the herpes viruses, uh, especially a herpes simplex virus type one and type two, and uh, there of which there are quite a few drugs that are very effective. And they need to know something of the biology of, of, of the herpes virus viruses as relates to management and to their uh, association as uh, etiological agents of disease in, in man. Now, these different agents cause disease and the, the mechanisms of pathogenicity that, is, that are expressed uh, by the different viruses. And by that, uh, in, in that, on that note, I, I would like to say that to the audience, I bring you greetings from the herpes, human herpes virus family. And I, I'm, and I hasten to add that two of the members of the family told me to tell you that they would not be offended if they never meet you personally. And they are human herpes virus type, herpes simplex virus type two and human herpes virus type eight. These viruses said, told me to tell you that if, you, if they never meet you, they'll be happy, but at least you know they exist, okay? And as we all know, these viruses are sexually transmitted. And so I'll say no more on that topic. I don't, I don't need to say any more. I think the point is well is taken. Now, in terms of uh, my day, some of the uh, uh, <clears throat> activities uh, at Howard University College of Medicine. Well, you know by now I'm an instructor. Uh, I give lectures in virology. Uh, to medical students, to dental students, and to graduate students. And I especially like the grad give, giving lectures to graduate students because, first of all, these students represent a different breed of folk in terms of their training, their background, and their expectations and their interests. And so this keeps me, this allows me uh, to become a more in-depth scientist in terms of virology. Uh, and, and, and I make an every effort to try to present the information that is gonna be useful to them and will get, provide, I try to provide insight into the, the mechanisms or the methodology of various procedure, key procedures that 
or or assays and assay including assays that uh, that they will encounter over over time. Now, as I said, the medical students have a different interest. They have different needs, and they know, and I know that they're not going to be tested on the intricacies of the biology of any one virus. But of course, there are many human viruses that cause disease. And of course, they have to know their names and the diseases that they cause. And if, if, if known, they have to know the mechanism of, of pathogenicity for each of these major uh, viral pathogens and therapeutic of, uh, approaches or and and uh, and immunization uh, if it's available uh, protection against these viruses through the va through vaccines and so we we make every effort to provide that information now when I when I first arrived at uh, Howard uh, virology microbiology was taught as a separate discipline in the second semester of the first year. And in the second year, <clears throat> uh, we had a course called Infectious Diseases, which I was asked to, uh, to coordinate. And this is the course in which we emphasize the clinical aspects of uh, virolo human virology. And this was a very interesting course that, uh, uh, that allowed us to uh, to recruit the services of clinicians, especially who had a background in infectious diseases, including viruses, bacteria, chlamydia and rickettsia, the mycoplasma, and so on. And uh, this was, uh, as I said, a very, very interesting course and a very challenging course. Well, for, for, nine, for a number of years, starting in 1972 up to 1998 or so, uh, the, 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 schedule, the uh, schedule for classes or courses was based along disciplinary lines. Thus, there were courses in anatomy, a, courses in, a course in biochemistry, a course in microbiology, as I've said, a course, or there, a course, there was a course in pathology, a course in physiology, and so on. In 1998, the College of Medicine received a letter from the Liaison Committee for Medical Education, also known as LCME, which, in which they, the College of Medicine, the dean of the college, was instructed to change the format of the college of instruction for the first two years at, in, at, the univer, at the College of Medicine. And I was working at that time, I was working uh, very closely with the Dean for Academic Affairs, whose name was Dr. Pauline Titus Dillon. And so when this letter was received at the, at the college, at the Dean's level, it was passed on to Dr. Titus Dillon since she was the Dean for Academic Affairs and thus had direct responsibility for the academic program starting at year one, running through years, year four. And so she asked me, would I be willing to, to oversee this effort, to lead the effort? And so I did, uh, I agreed to do this. And I hasten to add at that time, that I had a very supportive dean, Dr. Floyd Malvo, who was the dean of the College of Medicine and the previous chair of the Department of Microbiology, and he was very supportive of the uh, of the effort uh, to integrate the curriculum uh, for the first two years of, of medical education at Howard University. Now I can tell you that this was not fun. This was very challenging because there were some faculty members who were extremely resistant to any effort to, uh, <clears throat> to recast their discipline in any other format if it wasn't a separate uh, discipline unto itself, on course unto itself. And some, some, a few instructors felt so strongly about that that they left the College of Medicine, they left the university and sought employment elsewhere. There was one person in physiology who left, 
and another one in anatomy who left. And uh, there were some others who, who left, but this was just an indication of the kind of attitudes that you had to deal with as you undertook this effort. But suffice it to say, we were, uh, after working on this uh, <clears throat> initiative for about three years, we uh, successfully rolled out the first iteration of the current curriculum in, um, at Howard University College of Medicine in 2001. And this is a summary of, uh, the, uh, of the major uh, courses that are offered in, uh, in the year one. You can see the molecules and cells this is a combination of uh, between molecules and cells one and molecules and cells two. These core, these units or courses are, are are combinations of biochemistry, molecular biology, histology, and cell biology. And this is followed by structure and function units. There are three units, and this, of course, would em embrace uh, anatomy and physiology primarily. And so and most of the instruction was given within the first four hours of a school day from eight to four, eight to one, I should say, or eight to 12, eight to four, one o'clock, I guess is it. And uh, in the afternoon, the, in the first year, the students were required to take a course called population health, and which, uh, <clears throat> during which they were introduced to preceptors uh, who, who were physician, practicing physicians who would agree to allow these students, these first year students to shadow their activities in their various offices. In year two, the, we, uh, this is a real product, I think, major product of the integration effort. effort. We can, all of the uh, major courses were, were uh, organized in, in terms of organ systems. And you can see that uh, on year two, we start out with organ system one, and which really can, can, compri is comprised of pharmacology, microbiology, and, uh, and pathology. These are not organ systems, obviously, but uh, the decision was made just to use the terminology as a title, as an umbrella, so to speak, just to say we have six organ system units that span the second year. And as you can see, the uh, organ systems are, are, uh, are identified and they uh, expand the, uh, the entire second year. Most of the unit, the uh, course, the lectures and the laboratory sessions were offered in the morning. And in the afternoon, the students were enrolled in, in two, uh, two different uh, courses. One is called Introduction to Clinical Medicine and the other uh, activity that they were required to participate in was a small pathology, small group sessions. And these sessions, these pathology, small group sessions were are very have well received by the students and the students do extremely well in, the, in that course. It's a freestanding course. And it, 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 one of the reasons why, there are several reasons why this course is so successful. Number one, the instructors are outstanding. Number two, the instruction is highly focused. It's focused on pathology. And so they don't have to run the gamut of various disciplines uh, that you would encounter, say, in, in organ system three, where you talk in the respiratory component of that unit, you're talking about bacterial infections of the respiratory system, viral infections and whatever, you see. So it was a different uh, range of topics. And uh, this, this turns out to be very, very, very effective. Now, <clears throat> during the construction, uh, the design, the redesign of the organ system of the curriculum for years one and two, there were many uh, instructors, there were many faculty members who were extremely helpful in terms of making this a successful program. And at the risk of being uh, criticized for leaving people out, 
I will make the following uh, acknowledgments. I think that uh, Dr. Matthew George, who was the, who is the chair of biochemistry, was extremely helpful and supportive in terms of uh, reorganization of, uh, and he has bought into the reorganization of uh, biochemistry into this course, this course that we call molecules and cells one and molecules and cells two. And uh, we, we are very, very grateful uh, for his uh, input. Uh, we are very, great, very grateful for the input of the anatomist, uh, anatomy uh, faculty, many, many of the faculty who were, who were founding so-called so uh, co-founding members are no longer here. Some have passed on, some have retired, have retired and some have uh, moved to other uh, institutions. And so we are very grateful uh, to them. And with respect to the second year uh, organization of, of, of uh, construction for the second year, there are some people whose names are just so very important in terms of uh, the current program that we offer now. We think of Dr. Uh, Heath, Dr. Tedesta Heath was a very strong proponent of this approach and she has made major contributions to its success. Dr. Copeland, who is the chair of pharmacology has been very supportive of this approach and he has been very uh, uh, supportive of this approach. Dr. Uh, <clears throat> Victor Scott, who is no longer a, an active member, formal member of the faculty of the College of Medicine. He's a, re he's a professor emeritus and he volunteers his services in the form of lectures and small group uh, leadership uh, in organ system five. Uh, he is a he is an outstanding uh, member of that of that clinical faculty. And uh, of course, uh, Dr. Kasim, who is the chair of my department, is a major has been a major has made major contributions to the uh, success of this uh, of this program. Now, the we we think the we think that uh, the student our students are the beneficiaries of this approach uh, to medical education because what this especially year two the year two curriculum has been designed in such a way that when you start out with starting with organ system two, they are presented with instruction that is most heavily oriented toward the clinical side. And this uh, information prepares them, is designed to prepare them to successfully navigate step one of the USMLE licensure examination, which is a critical step in their, on their career path because the students in the medical school are required to take and pass step one of the USMLE series in order to be promoted to the third year of the, of the uh, four-year program, the standard four-year program. And so this is very, very, very important. This is a very, very, uh, very uh, important approach and has been very successful. It's been this, uh, the year two schedule, the year two format has been uh, tweaked uh, several times. Uh, we, and when we started out, we had too many units, too many organ system units. And we, every two weeks we had an exam and that didn't go over too well with the students. So we consolidated some of the smaller uh, organ system units. For example, you see an organ system two, musculoskeletal and skin and uh, and yeah, and hemopoietic uh, and lymphoreticular systems are, 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 are presented. And so this is, but these, the skin system is relatively small at, at this level. 
The musculoskeletal system is very small in terms of the owls or instruction. Uh, the largest component of OS2 is, deals with uh, HLS, hematopoietic and lymphoreticular system, which is a major, major system. And so uh, we, we have organized this, we've learned how to organize these, these uh, systems into workable packets of information that students can master. And the students do very well in the organ system, all of the organ systems units except organ system unit one. Organ system unit one is very challenging, over, over, has been over, over the years very challenging, and uh, it, it uh, <clears throat> remains so because of its very nature. Pharmacology is not a, is not a basket weaving type level course. Clinical microbiology is very challenging, as is pathology, basic pathology. And with respect to pharmacology and pathology, these, you, these courses are, are presented at, at the beginning of year two. And this is the first time, this marks the first uh, introduction that these students will have had to these two uh, disciplines, pharmacology and pathology. And uh, <clears throat> so this is, uh, explains in part why you, uh, OS1 is very, very challenging. Now, I, I know all of the students who, who are HB, who are undergraduate students who may be in the audience, you know, some are, some have some interest, many of the students have an interest in medical school. And I would just say this, that different medical schools use different approaches to present the same basic information. Because we, we have to, under, we all understand that all of our students, no matter what you know, institution you are enrolled in, you must at some point in time, take and pass step one and step two of the USMLE series. We know that. And so it is that it is incumbent on us to provide the environment and the uh, the academic environment and the uh, physical environment that would support your, uh, that will en enhance your efforts to be successful. We know that. And so some schools will, uh, will be, organ their curricula will be or organized differently than, than our curriculum. Along those lines, we have been told here at Howard at the College of Medicine that our curriculum will change and uh, it will change it for the first two years. And the one driving factor uh, we're told is that we want to uh, enable our students to be more competitive at the end of their fourth, in the middle of their fourth year so that they can be uh, interviewed early on for residency uh, uh, positions. It turns out that because of the way uh, we organized step uh, years one and two. The students lose about six, they, are, they turn out to be, many students turn out to be six months or so behind uh, a large number of students who have, will have um, navigated the same information in a shorter period of time uh, and have taken the, will have taken the exams. And so they are eligible, will be eligible to uh, to apply for uh, residency op uh, positions at an, uh, approximately six months earlier than our students. So that is a driving factor that we will consider that must be considered in the reconstruction or the re reorganization of our year one and year two uh, instruction. I think that uh, uh, by way of uh, encouragement and inspiration to students who are not necessarily interested in becoming physicians or dentists or other healthcare providers, I would hasten to say that graduate education is very challenging if it's well done. Virology is one of it is my field of interest. And virology, of course, is a very can be a very challenging field. And Dr. Kusolas and Dr. Uchi are, are have been are 
our uh, now colleagues. I've known Dr. Kasulis uh, over a longer period of time. Dr. Uh, Uchi, uh, which is who's fondly known as Ken Kingsley, I believe by people far and wide in, in Louisiana, is a recent graduate. And I have been told that he has been recently admitted to LSU's med school. And we congratulate him for that uh, achievement. He had also applied to Howard's uh, Medical School and he was on the waiting list, but LSU got him first. And I, I reckon I, I congratulate him for that success. I think that uh, if you're a graduate, if you are interested in graduate school and gra in graduate school, I think you would do well to to pay attention to and take every opportunity to take advantage of the serve good the services that Dr. Kasulis uh, provides under the aegis of the uh, aegis of the Louisiana Biomedical Research uh, Network. Uh, this is a, seems to be a very wonderful program, and I just take my hat off to him uh, for having the stamina and the vision and the will to see to put such a program in in place and to and to sustain it for such a period a long period of time. This takes uh, this is not easy to to administer. It is a multifaceted program. It has many components, and uh, we, I hope that you all will take advantage of, of the various uh, programs and assets that this uh, network offers. I uh, also would like to mention to you that one of the recently I learned that a graduate of Grambling University, which is a part of the network, uh, is now the, is, has been recently appointed as the chair of anatomy here at the College of Medicine. His name is Dr. Byron Ford. And he comes to us with a very tremendous uh, uh, CV. He has done some very important, very important work. And we look forward to his, uh, his uh, joining us and becoming very active uh, in the instruction and guidance of our students and interaction with members of the faculty at large. This is, uh, so this is a plus, of course, for, um, for uh, Grambling. I also would like to acknowledge the fact that we have, uh, met, have admitted, the College of Medicine, I should say, has, it, has admitted many students uh, from Xavier and some from Grambling, and I think some from Southern University uh, into our medical school. And the, many of these students have done extremely well. And we welcome your continued interest in and in, in the College of Medicine at Howard University. We all know that entry acceptance into medical schools is very competitive. We receive about 87,000 uh, applications a week, a year or so, I think it is. I don't think I'm exaggerating that number too, too much. And it's whittled down to about 125 or maybe 150 or maybe a few more who were accepted. And we have a class size of 125, I think now, and uh, it's going to be enlarged, uh, enlarged soon. But the point is that it is very competitive and medical school and acceptance is extremely competitive. And so you want to be as well prepared as, as you as you can be, and to be uh, be uh, you know competitively to be competitive. I think that one thing I'm, I would like to say by I hope provide some inspiration to you as we look as you look forward is this. Over time, I have re, have been able to recall information that I first learned at Morgan State College. And that was over 70 years ago. In some of my chemistry classes, some of my physics classes, and some of my biology classes. I have recalled some of the inf basic information that I learned. 
And of course, the same is true for information that I learned at Hopkins under Roy Bernard. And I took a course in immunology and this was a very useful course, especially they had a very strong focus as you would predict on, on complement. And so we, we learned a lot about how element, the proteins and subunits of the complement system uh, worked and what their function was. And we've come to learn even more about the importance of the complement system in innate, in innate immunity as well as adaptive immunity. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a very important sy uh, system. Now, um, <clears throat> Some of the information that I learned at Morgan it turned out to be very helpful when, uh, when I was at Hopkins. Uh, some of the information I learned in quantitative analysis, which was not one of my favorite courses, nevertheless became very, very powerful and, and useful when I got to, uh, when I came, went to, to Hopkins. Also, when I worked at Microbiological Associates, uh, I served as the director of quality control for that company. It was a very small company by today's standards, but it was a one of, it was the pioneer company at that time uh, who, that offered uh, viable cell cultures. And so, so this company uh, prepared uh, cell cultures, offered living cell cultures in various kinds of sizes. They prepared media for the growth and uh, propagation of these cell uh, cell lines and cell cultures. And my job was to oversee the quality of the medium that was produced and the quality of the cell cultures that were shipped out to institutions like NIH and other institutions across the country. And what I'm, the reason, my, my point is this, that it went in, when I was involved with quality control work, a lot of this work has to deal with physical and various physical properties and various biochemical and biological or biochemical properties of some of the components of the medium, uh, the media that we uh, produce. And so the information that I learned at Morgan was, was very useful. And so that meant that these terms, this terminology was not new to me when I got to uh, by microbiological associates. And so, and it continues. And it turns out that even today when I teach graduate students, I can fall back on information that I first learned at Morgan State University. And so, uh, you, so you can never learn too much. It's a question of how you store it, how you recall it, how you use it. And so, uh, you know, yes, this is, uh, this is all, and, you know, an open, open, open-ended uh, process. My journey has been open-ended. I've been at Howard 50 years. It's been 70 years since I graduated from, from Morgan State University. And if all goes well, I'm trying to, um, I have my goal set to be around Howard for another 20 years or so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that will bring a laugh to many people, of course, including myself. But, but the point is that I'm healthy, I think I'm healthy. I think I'm able to provide instruction. I think that I am fortunate enough to understand what students expect of me as an instructor and what I have to do to help prepare them to, to treat patients. I think I have that understanding. And I think the point I would like to make to the students in the audience is this. I think it turns out that we all work and we usually work for someone or something. And there are not many people who work solely unto themselves in this world and who provide a service who that is not uh, you know, made available to some other people in some way. And so if, when you look at it that way, you want to be able to be to do the best you can to be as helpful to as many people as you can in a meaningful way, in a very solid and meaningful way. And that, of course, is a challenge. And, uh, <clears throat> and I think that uh, I, accept it, I accept that. And I uh, have uh, been well received by graduate students over time. And 
uh, as you may have seen in the um, the lead up to uh, to my introductory slide, I you know many graduate students do think a lot of me, and I think a lot of them. And because I, I, the reason they think of not because you know of the way I look or act so much is as to what I do for them, and I uh, and I think this is you know a conscious effort. This is not an accident. You know I just don't do this because it's it, I've got to do it. it. It's because I want to do it, and I think I know how to do it, and I am I feel a great reward when I'm successful, and I think that. You all, every student who wants, who has a career endpoint in mind, goal endpoint in mind, or goal in mind, you want to be successful. I think we all want to be successful at what we do. And that requires many talents and skills, not the least of which is interpersonal inter, uh, interaction. You must be able to deal with other people. And some people are much more clever than I'll ever be in dealing with other people. They can read people better than I can uh, and whatever. But, but, the, but the bottom line is you have, if you're gonna be successful, you have to be able to deal with other people effectively because you don't, these jobs don't exist for the most part in a vacuum. And uh, you know, they, you, you really are required to, to be and to have a social side, so to speak, or an interpersonal side. So, if there are, are there any questions that anyone like to, would like to ask me? Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Juan, for a very uh, important uh, seminar and you know sharing with you, with us, all of us, your your experiences. Um, uh, it's been really uh, wonderful to hear you know your life story. But I think you know there are two major things that. Um, I, I suspect um, sort of emanate from your presentation. Uh, one of it is really what I tell students that, you know, especially the PhD program, that P stands for persistence and, and uh, you know, performance occasion under pressure, but even more, you know, patience, you know, to really keep going and uh, keep doing things and never really give up. And the second point is what I think you alluded to multiple times, you know, the, the role of mentorship and having uh, examples and people that are willing to help. And I think all of us are seeking through our career, we have been blessed to have really good people, um, but also uh, most of us have experienced the opposite too, right? So I That's think right. it's, very, it's very important to seek out those mentors and people that uh, are really committed to helping others to help students succeed and so on. And that's, I think, quite important. And I need to tell you also that uh, to the audience that um, Dr. Bernard Roisman was not particularly an easy person. He had a very high, high um, sort of standing for research. Uh, occasionally he would say, if you're not committed to academia, if you're not committed to research, if you don't do good science, get out of science. Let, let the people that really want to do this uh, to stay in the field. So I think having Dr. Wan succeed and be mentored by Bernard Reutzman, it's not necessarily an easy task. Uh, you have to really rise to a very high standard uh, to be able to uh, work uh, with uh, Bernard Reutzman over the years. So I, I assume even his early years was even more intense well, than what I experienced as a postdoctoral fellow. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I think so. And uh, yeah, he was very, uh, very demanding and very, uh, you know, had very high standards. And one of the striking things about Bernard is that he could write so well. He could write, he could organize information in a way that I never thought about, you know. And I finally learned, uh, you know, some of his uh, skills and learned some of his approaches and you know, I, I I can write fairly well now, and then um, <clears throat> I'm I'm considered to be a, a, a very good lecturer because I, I and I think a good part of that it came from Bernard because I remember many of his you know lectures in virology I really do, yeah. and uh, it gave me in, an insight uh, as to uh, you know how to approach this, 
And that, that really is a challenge because so many instructors, quite a few instructors, even here at Hound, don't really master that. that, that uh, yeah. That. And I think, uh, Philip, you probably agree with me that especially for minority students, uh, you know, we need to reach out to them. They need to understand that they, um, there are um, huge opportunities anywhere and there are good people. That's what we're trying to do through the LBRM program or being mentored and achieving uh, you know, higher degrees, uh, getting to medical school, uh, whatever they need to do. I think it's uh, within the reach, uh, provided that they put the effort and the commitment and are patient and find the right people to help them uh, and guide them through that process. So I wanna yeah. open, yeah, is anybody else that would like to ask uh, Dr. Ryan a question at this point? I think, you know, I want to thank Dr. Ron again for his wonderful presentation. This was recorded and it will be available on the LBRN website. It will be disseminated to the undergraduate and graduate programs at the HBCUs. Um, and I'm sure that uh, Dr. Ron could be contacted uh, to share any other information that he has with you. Yeah, I'd be more than happy to. Yeah. Anything I can do. Yeah, absolutely. I think you are a raw example of what it is to survive through very difficult times. I just can't imagine it was comments, you know, being an African-American graduate student at Johns Hopkins in the mid fifties. <laughs> I mean, the amount of resilience and patience and, uh, you know, overseeing obstacles, overcoming obstacles, mm -hmm. it must be unbelievable. So I think more power to you, Philip. Uh, yeah, well, it took a lot of determination, I tell you. Well, that's it is, you know, it's like the energizer. We don't stop, we keep going. We may go, <laughs> we may go down for a while, but we keep pushing forward. Um, so thank you very much for your uh, seminar and uh, look forward to uh, chatting with you. And uh, I also wanted to give you the personal greetings of uh, uh, Dr. John Stewart, who is actually the MD, PhD, graduate of Howard University and the director of the LSU Health Science Center Stanley oh, Scott Cancer Center. Uh, right. His personal greetings. Apparently, you taught him uh, yes. microbiology when he was at the medical school. So, oh yes, thank you very much.